Uh, good morning. Um, thank you very much to WIDE for the invitation to participate uh, in the panel and the conference, and also to Miguel, who organized uh, this, this panel. Uh, as you can see, I have a very grand title, social assistant in the 21st century. Uh, uh, as you know, um, is, this is about low and middle income countries, not, not, not high income countries, although high income countries will get a mention uh, as, I, as I move on my presentation. Um, I, I, I wanted to say that uh, normally when we discuss social protection issues, uh, discussions tend to get normative very quickly. Uh, by normative, I mean what ought to happen or what ought to be there in, in low and middle income countries. But this presentation is really, I have taken out all the um, normative side of it, and I'm going to focus really on the positive side, that is what is there in terms of social assistance. Um, as Miguel indicated, uh, one of the limitations we had for describing what is there in terms of social assistance is the absence of uh, reliable, um, harmonized uh, data sets on social assistance. But that uh, is, is changing very quickly. And uh, Miguel mentioned the uh, SAPI uh, database. Uh, I also have a sister database, which is called Social Assistance in Low and Middle Income Countries. They are, they are sister, as if you have a look at them, they are very close together. And of course, there is the ASPAR uh, database from the World Bank. So the, the data base for discussing these issues has improved and hopefully will continue to improve. And so I'm going to base on that information to uh, really have a focus on what there is as opposed to what there should be there, right? Um, the presentation, I got three main um, 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 aspects of it. The first is to show you the large expansion of social assistance provision in low and middle income countries. Uh, I think that probably is not uh, very surprising to you, but with the global data that we have, we're able to provide much more detail on that, um, as, as you will see. Um, now, I'm interested in this from the perspective of the institutions, uh, welfare institutions that are emerging in low and middle income countries. Uh, so I'm, I'm much more focused in terms of institutions as opposed to particular policies or, or programs. I'm not going to say very much about outcomes either. Uh, I'm just interested as a researcher uh, looking ahead what kind of welfare institutions are, 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 are are going to be in, in uh, low and middle income countries. So that is my interest. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, if, we, if we look at what there is now, uh, it's likely that social assistance will play a prominent role. Uh, whereas in high income countries, the social insurance plays a prominent role and social assistance is residual. If we look at what we have now, it would appear that the, the, the welfare institutions are going to be quite different. Uh, so that, that's, um, that's the, the second um, aspect of my presentation. And then, of course, I'm interested in what, what are the things that we should be looking into and perhaps we're not looking into. And so we have research gaps. And I got three that I want to discuss very briefly at the end of my presentation. Uh, first of all, why is it that there is this expansion of social assistance in low and middle income countries? We know, for example, that programs work well. We know to some extent the context in which programs work better than others. Uh, but we don't know why there has been this expansion. So causal explanations uh, of this expansion of social assistance are really at a very early stage. The second thing I want to discuss is the relative weight of protection and social investment. This is discussed uh, quite extensively in high income countries, uh, and perhaps we should pay more attention to it in uh, low and middle income countries. And the third issue, which is also, in my view, under research, is the politics of vertical uh, redistribution as opposed to horizontal redistribution. We spend a lot of time discussing horizontal redistribution, much less so uh, vertical redistribution. But if we want to understand the expansion of social assistance, we need to understand you know, what is the politics behind the, the, these, um, these developments. So that is, the, that is the structure of my presentation. Uh, I'm, going to, uh, um, I'm going to start with some um, definitions. I know that this might look very didactic to you, and perhaps you, you know this really well, but I really need to do this uh, for the rest of my presentation, so I apologize in advance if, you, if this is really 
very well known to you. I'm sorry to repeat this. I'm also, I'm also a, a, a teacher, so that I do this as, as a natural course of action. You know, the first thing you do, you start with this. So uh, perhaps it's also a professional bias on my part. Um, be, uh, but it's also important because in the context of international development, we, we are very loose with our definition. So I, I, want to, I want to get this much more precise. Now, this is normally how uh, traditionally, for example, the ILO has looked at uh, social policy. You have on the one hand basic service provision, which is education, health, housing. Those are mainly services in kind, transfers in kind. And then you have social protection, which are transfers in cash. And there are, there are three types, which I'm going to probably reduce to two. On the one hand, you have social insurance, which consists of contributory programs that address life cycle uh, uh, risks, as well as employment, employment risk and employment related uh, risks. Uh, and you have social assistance, which um, is budget finance, is rules based, and I'm going to place uh, a lot of stress on this, uh, particularly in the, in the context of identifying which programs are social assistance and which programs are not. This is really important, what, what is rules-based and what is not rules-based, and the address poverty and vulnerability. In the traditional ILO uh, perspective, because there is also something called labor market policy, passive labor market policy consists of uh, workers' rights, um, they, they are still there in most countries in terms of legislation. But the active uh, labor market policy increasingly has, is feeding into either social insurance or, or social assistance. In countries that have those two kind of components of social protection, there are some, for example, training programs within social insurance. And there is increasingly uh, a, a very high uh, proportion of uh, active labor market policies which are integrated with social assistance programs, particularly CCT. So perhaps the third one is going to drop out at some point. It's really important to keep this distinction in mind. Conceptually, because um, social insurance is about horizontal redistribution. So you pay contributions to your pension fund today, and when you retire, you draw the benefits from it. So it's, it's horizontal redistribution across the life cycle. Whereas social assistance is vertical redistribution. It's from the better off to the worse off. So conceptually, it's really important to keep this distinction in mind. Now, because um, I, I suspect many of you work in international development, it's really important also to make a distinction between emergency assistance and social assistance. I have in the table a large number of of distinctions that you can come up, um, the list could be, could be even longer. Uh, emergency assistance and social assistance are, are very different. But in the work of the international, particularly the UN bodies, the two get merged, simply because of operational reasons. You know, uh, the World Bank um, focus on safety nets because that is the work that they do. And so they don't make the distinction between social assistance and uh, emergency assistance, they tend them together. The same, the same for the IMF. Uh, um, it, it is confusing sometimes because if you look at the most recent um, World Bank publications, like the state of safety nets, they refer to safety nets or social assistance as if they were the same thing. But in fact, they are quite, quite, quite different. Now, I'm not going to take you through a list, but there are a few that are really important. The first one, for example, emergency assistance deals with misfortune. Uh, social assistance addresses poverty and vulnerability, which is mainly related to the economic system, to the consequence of the economic system. In, in most cases, capitalism, right? So there, there is a substantial difference in there. If you look at the, uh, the driving principle behind it, uh, emergency assistance driving principle is the Samaritan principle. You don't ask, you know, when someone is, uh, is had an emergency, um, you don't, or, or, or in cases of humanitarian assistance, you don't ask for the socioeconomic status of the people, you just, you just help them. But in, on the other hand, social assistance um, is sort of built around a citizenship principle in which societies have a, a commitment to maintaining a minimum living standard. The other one which is important is that um, if you look at the actors involved, uh, in emergency assistance you have NGOs, charities, uh, UN emergency services, and increasingly in social assistance you have ministries of social development or agencies that are spe specifically charged 
uh, in low and middle income countries with implementing uh, uh, social assistance. The last one is also important. The main objectives of emergency assistance are consumption and recovery, whereas in the case of social assistance, you have consumption and social investment. So there are very significant differences between the two, and in what I'm going to uh, discuss, and in the kind of database that we have collected, we make this distinction uh, very clearly. And we focus solely on social assistance, right? For, for the reasons that I discussed. <laughs> now, um, okay, so if you look at, if you take a global view of low and middle income countries, and we use the data sets that we have collected, this is more or less what we have. So you have on the one hand, as, as Miguel has already uh, shown, an increase in the number of programs. Um, so you go from 89, typically social assistance programs in 2000, to 224 in 2015. In some cases, there is some kind of inflation here because there are some very small programs, particularly in sub saharan Africa. In, in the way in which some countries do social assistance, they distinguish between different groups that are vulnerable. So you have one program for people who are with disabilities, you have another program for all, all the people, you have another program for children and so on. So there, is, there might be some kind of inflation there, but you can see very clearly in terms of the, uh, of, of the beneficiaries, in terms of the reach of the programs, that, that increases from 94, 95 um, million in 2000 to 842 million in 2015. This is probably an underestimate because uh, we don't have data for all countries for all years. So uh, it's likely that if we did have perfect data, this would be much more like uh, a billion or thereabouts. Uh, the other point to make about the, the, this uh, figure is that it includes both direct beneficiaries and indirect beneficiaries. For example, uh, where you have a social pension, it comes to the older person, to the pensioner. But it's unlikely that the pensioner is not going to uh, share that uh, transfer with other members of the family. In fact, I have done uh, field work on, on this issue in Brazil and South Africa, and the majority of respondents said that they share most of their social pension with the rest of the household. It's really hard to think about the situation where you, know, you have a family who is, um, uh, who is rich by social assistance, and someone would say, you, you, are, you are getting a social pension, this is your dinner, and the rest of you, that's your dinner. Right? It's really hard to think about that. So it's important to think about social assistance in terms of all the direct and indirect beneficiaries. And this figure of uh, 842 million covers both of them. Uh, if, you look at the, um, uh, if you look at it by region, the, there are kind of different trends. So the, the, the expansion is not even across all regions, as you can see from there. The top is South Asia. Um, these are just raw numbers. Um, incidentally, it's really hard to normalize this uh, for the reasons that um, 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 Martin Ravelion was discussing this morning. You know, the, 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 the reach of uh, the beneficiaries of social assistance might not be necessarily people who are in extreme poverty, right? So it's really difficult to normalize. Uh, so it's better to present the actual the raw figures. But as you can see, there has been an expansion, a very large expansion of, uh, in South Asia. Um, a lot of it is to do with perhaps the uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in India, the, the big expansion between 2005 and 2010. But there is also a, 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 an expansion in um, Latin America, although perhaps a, a level enough by 2015 then it becomes much more difficult. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa the, has been an expansion in terms of the number of programs, but in terms of the number of beneficiaries, uh, that is not as strong. Um, there are very mixed kind of trends in uh, Europe and Central Asia. As you can see, you know, the, arrow, the, the lines move, move, move a lot there. Okay, so the, the, the expansion is not uneven. And even within the regions, it's, it's also not uneven because different countries within a region might have different um, um, different conditions. Now, um, uh, uh, one question that we need to right, one question we need to discuss is co what are the types of social assistance programs? And um, you have uh, usually from, uh, say, the World Bank or the other UN agencies, 
a, a, a distinction between different instruments on the basis of the functions. So you have public works, you have uh, conditional transfers, unconditional transfers. Uh, in, in this database, we are uh, looking at them from a much more, hopefully, conceptual uh, perspective, which is to look at the understanding of poverty which underpins this uh, program. So you have programs which are only transferring income, uh, and the, the assumption there is that poverty is to do with consumption primarily, and that by transferring income, you are going to improve the consumption of these families. There are other types of programs that combine transfers of uh, income and, and assets, either human assets or community assets, uh, and, and therefore they understand poverty has to do with productivity deficits, not just consumption deficits, but productivity deficits too. Uh, conditional cash transfer programs, for example, are there employment guarantee programs are, are, are engaged in improving community assets. And then you have um, other types of programs that uh, place a very strong emphasis on inclusion, right? Uh, these programs tend to have quite a lot of intermediation. That is, is you, you don't, uh, beneficiaries don't simply receive an, a, a transfer in cash every month, but there is also someone that is in touch with the households and follow up with what the households are doing. Intermediation is important. Uh, Chile Solidaria, for example, BRAC, um, 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 uh, challenging the front of poverty reaction is also another example, right? So inclusion plays as much a role as assets and, and, and consumption. If you look at those ones, and this, this is very interesting, this is what you get in terms of the actual reach of, the, of social assistance. The, the blue ones are pure uh, income transfers. They transfer income or in, to improve consumption. Uh, the, the pink ones are employment guarantees. The green ones are conditional transfers. And the top break ones are uh, uh, programs that are aim to improve the inclusion of families. So they are more integrated, they're multidimensional, they have much more of, in the way of intermediation. I'll come back to that point later on. Okay, now, so that is what there is, right? Um, now, if you put it in, in, in a global context, and here I'm going to use data from ASPAR because uh, we, we didn't collect data on social insurance. Uh, ASPAR is, is quite useful because they, are, they base their estimates uh, of, of beneficiaries of uh, social assistance and social insurance on the basis of household surveys. At the same time, that has some difficulties, some issues with it, which I, I don't have the time to uh, go into, but I'd be quite happy to discuss later on. Now, this is what is interesting. The red ones are the, are the households in the household surveys that receive nothing, no social insurance, no social assistance. The third that Martin Ravelian was discussing this morning in his presentation, uh, the, the green ones um, are uh, households uh, that receive only, only social assistance. That is the green one. And as, and as you can see, uh, the green one is very, very, very significant in most uh, regions uh, there. Uh, the, uh, the, the orange one are the ones that receive only, only social uh, insurance. And then you have the blue ones that receive both. Now, the kind of uh, takeaway from this is that basically uh, social assistance, in terms of the number of beneficiaries, in terms of the reach of the program, is, is the dominant component of social protection. Of course, if you look at it in terms of budgets, the opposite is the case. Social insurance is much more significant than, than social assistance. But if you look at it in terms of the number of beneficiaries, then social assistance is important. Right, I'm going to miss the next one because it will take me uh, a bit of time. Right, yes, I don't. Okay, so uh, very quickly about the research gaps. Um, so it's likely, uh, it's likely that on the basis of what we have seen so far in the 21st century, it's likely that the welfare institutions, uh, social protection in low and middle income countries is going to be based around the core of social assistance, not social insurance. That is an anomaly, if you look at it from the perspective of high-income countries, particularly European countries. So we need to explain why is it that this is happening in low- and middle-income countries. There are lots of explanations that you see in the list there. Unfortunately, these are all environmental explanations. So you have the democratization processes that facilitate social demand, economic growth that facilitate fiscal space, uh, left Coalition governments, uh, for example, in Latin America in the 1990s, and sorry, in the 2000s, international context, Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, 
Uh, the lack of dynamism and failure of the social system, of the social insurance model, which is particularly acute in uh, Eastern and Central Europe, uh, the former socialist countries, and also in Latin America. Uh, but notice that all these are not, it's not something that happened in 2000. It's something that has been there before. There are, there are kind of uh, instances, uh, phases where these conditions have been, have been there in the past. A lot, of, a lot of research has gone into looking at social assistance as an electoral tool. Um, just the, the, the quick response that I would give is that uh, the more we look at it, the more that it isn't an electoral tool. This is why their rule space is, is, you know, like politicians that want to use social assistance as an electoral tool would be much better off putting hospitals in place or schools in place than giving private transfers. And, and not only private transfers, but where they cannot control who gets it because there are rules that prevent them from manipulating that. Okay, um, very quickly. Two, what is the relative weight of social investment and, 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 and protection? Um, again, uh, as you could see from uh, my picture there, uh, as conditional income transfers and integrated anti-poverty programs are a very significant part in terms of the uh, reach of, the, of social assistance. So clearly there is a much greater interest on uh, social investment and we need to know a bit better what is the, what is the uh, relative weight of these two. There is a lot more to discuss. Um, again, this is something that has been discussed a lot in the context of European countries. In 2013, the European, European uh, Union passed a social investment package that is pushing European countries towards greater social investment. And, and what is interesting is, is that in terms of social assistance in, in low and middle income countries, it's happening for low income groups as opposed to better off groups, right? And the last one, uh, perhaps this is the most important. We don't know very much about the politics of vertical redistribution. The politics of horizontal redistribution is really straightforward. Why is it that people have social insurance? Simple, because they face similar risks. And by pulling risks, they are going to be better off. And this is why you have uh, social insurance. It's, it's, it's self-interest that propels people to put forward, uh, to implement and, and, and belong to social insurance programs. Why would better off people uh, pay taxes to reduce uh, poverty, uh, groups which perhaps they are never going to belong to. That is a different, uh, that is a different question altogether. And I have here uh, social contracts, uh, um, left coalitions, uh, transfers are an electoral tool as uh, potential uh, avenues where we need to try to work out why is it that, what is the politics behind the expansion of social assistance. And I'll leave you with my conclusions because I have run out of time. Many thanks. Thank you.